Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Give us a half a wave, everybody. It's amazing to see 158 people here to support Tamsin Cottis on her amazing book release. Tonight, we've got an hour and 15 minutes of exciting stuff. We'll hear from Christina with publishing director from Carmack. Uh, we'll hear extracts from the author herself, Tamsin Cottis. We'll have a short writing exercise. So there's going to be loads of people who will be like, what? I don't, I don't write poetry. We'll hear from Ros Reed about how the book connects with aspects of the integrative um, child training. Uh, we'll also visit Dr. Anna Alvarez to hear her thoughts. And finally, we will give you, the public, the opportunity to ask questions, share your thoughts, or just listen to the writers speak themselves. I'd really like to start us off with talking a little bit about this book, which I found really interesting because I work as a facilitator. My name is RG, AKA the Lino, AKA a play and facilitator working with drama and the arts within workspaces, schools, hospitals, prison settings, as well as uh, immigration removal centers. And this book is interesting to me because it validated a lot of the work that I have done within spaces without even knowing I was using certain approaches. This book sort of brought me into that world. And it says objects, play and child psychotherapy. And we're talking a lot about objects today. And I was wondering whether you could let me know what objects you think have been um, landmarks for you, like things that you've stuck by you throughout your lives. What objects are meaningful to you? That might be an object like a fork or uh, an object like a mug, or it might be something like a blanket you've always kept. Let me know in the chat window what objects are important to you because we want to know. And our objects, sometimes they make us who we are. And that's always interesting to see. Throughout the event, I'm going to be asking you to put stuff into the chat window. Obviously, you can share as much or as little as you choose to share. And um, sure enough, uh, we're going to create some work, some poetry later on, and we might draw on these objects. So I'm waiting now. Who can put a couple of objects that are important to them into the chat window? Who's going to be the first? It's always a bit of nerves about being the first person because you know I'm going to pick them out. Um, brilliant. Rosie says books. Yes, books travel with us everywhere we go. And uh, certain poets keep books in their inside pockets. I'm not one of those poets. Childhood soft toy, a guitar, a plate from my mother for 30 years, shells. Uh, objects are some clay models I made in my 20s that express the feelings then. Yeah, and sometimes the objects that we have, they shift over time. Tamsin's often talked to me about how objects can be really important for us for certain periods of time in our lives and then they can go away and disappear just like how poems are really important to me for certain times in my life and then suddenly they just disappear and I move on to the next poem or the next idea. I love that as a vehicle. Um, a mug from a movie, Labyrinth, great movie, thank you. Pottery tortoise given to me by my great uncle nearly 50 years ago. So objects hold many stories and today we're going to be capturing some of those stories. Um, we have to draw attention. Uh, this book and all the books out there are brought together by publishers and publishers have the amazing job of bringing these sorts of products to the public. Uh, it takes a lot to be a publisher because without them, we couldn't reach an audience as writers. Uh, there's so much work that goes into it. And this is published by uh, Karnak Books, which I visited their website. I, I didn't know about them before. Um, they're dedicated to psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, and related subjects such as organizations, family, child, and adolescent studies. Let's take a moment to hear from Christina Whit Perry, who is the publishing director at Karnak. Christina, how are you doing? Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, RD. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's a great honor to be able to uh, participate in this book launch um, for Tamsin's wonderful book, which is one of the very first to be published at the relaunched Karnak Books. And um, I'm going to tell you just a little bit of, of history about Karnak. 
So Karnak Bookshop was founded in 1950 and Karnak, Harry Karnak was the publisher and he started publishing books um, in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy at that time. And that tradition kept going for many, many years until 2016 when Karnak Publishers was the list, the book list was sold to Taylor and Francis Routledge. So many of the books that you knew originally as Karnak are now Routledge books. In the meantime, Routledge decided that they didn't want to use the Karnak name. And that name um, was in danger of disappearing completely. And so Confer, the organization that um, puts uh, together events and workshops for psychotherapists and psychoanalysts, decided to buy both the Karnak bookshop in its online version and the name Karnak for future publishing enterprise. We started publishing under the Karnak imprint in 20, at the end of 2020, and Tamsin's is actually the second book to appear in the new Karnak books imprint. And Karnak bookshop is also having a rebirth um, in a new premises, which will be opening in July. And that is in Brodie House on Stripe Street in um, Spitalfields, very near Liverpool Street Station. So if anyone wants to go and visit, um, please, please do. And we will be having a bookshop opening party physically as soon as we possibly can. I wanted to also, thank Tamsin for having the, the bravery really to participate in this book launch. And um, I am very proud to present Tamsin's book in all its glory and to uh, have a little shout out for my colleagues as well. Brett Parr, who made this possible through his connection with Tamsin and brought her into the Karnak author fold. Also my colleague, loyal colleague Liz Wilson, who was in it from the beginning and um, is really the person who's responsible for making Tamsin's manuscript into a physical copy, um, which she did with grace under pressure like no other. And I also want to introduce Emily Whitten, who has turned off her camera, um, who's our newest member of the team. And she's just been with us for a month. And she actually organized this event with the help of RG and Tamsin and um, Vicky Capstick, who's our marketing manager. So thank you ever so much to everybody. And the cover was designed by Stephen Taylor of Heat Design, who I don't think is here, but I just wanted to give him a word of praise as well. Um, those of you who have a copy of this book will also know that it has some beautiful um, chapter openers with the bird that shows on the front cover is also on the chapter openers and sort of flies across the page as you go through each chapter. Thanks, Christina. What an absolute pleasure from Karnak Books. And so I'm going to go to the writer themselves uh, Tamsin Cottage. To give her a round of applause, instead of a clap, we're going to do a deaf clap like this. Everybody, Tamsin Cottage. Tamsin, how you doing? I'm very well, thank you, RG. Uh, it's brilliant that you're here to do this bit because it's, yeah, it's really fantastic. Thank you. And thank you, Christina, and echoing all those thanks to Karnak for, um, for taking it on, really, an idea that was not even quarter cooked when I got in touch with you via Brett. So thank you again, Brett, for that. Right now, I just want to get going and, and just say that really the starting point for the book was my in growing interest in the significance of objects in therapy um, and, and the objects in art. I do a lot of writing, poetry and short stories and that there's things and motifs that appear in there. And it's just something I've had on my mind and it brings my two worlds together. Uh, and I want to start by reading a poem which uh, is by Roger Robinson, whose collection of Portable Paradise won the T.S. Eliot Prize in 2019. And this poem, to say that it speaks to me is just a complete understatement, actually. It, it kind of just keeps calling to me wherever I go. And it's been on the tube, which has been an absolute joy as well. So I'm just going to read the poem. I think it should come up on the screen as well so you can see it. A Portable Paradise by Roger Robinson. And if I speak of paradise, then I'm speaking of my grandmother, who told me to carry it always on my person, concealed, so no one else would know but me. 
that way they can't steal it, she'd say. And if life puts you under pressure, trace its ridges in your pocket. Smell its piney scent on your handkerchief. Hum its anthem under your breath. And if your stresses are sustained and daily, get yourself to an empty room, be it hotel, hostel or hovel. Find a lamp and empty your paradise onto a desk. Your white sands, green hills and fresh fish. Shine the lamp on it like the fresh hope of morning and keep staring at it till you sleep. And uh, when I first came across this poem, I thought, that's it. That's what, a, that's what a transitional object does. That's how an object can work for a person. It captures the fact that it's central to a relationship with his grandmother. It captures the fact that special objects have to feel a certain way and sometimes smell a certain way. And they can be a condensed... Uh, condensed experience of so many aspects of ourselves. So I've had this poem actually as a bit of a companion, especially over this last difficult year. Um, and to link it with my work as a therapist, I've always been very attracted to the work of Donald Winnicott. Those of you who, who I work with will know this, I think fangirl might be the word. He was a paediatrician and child analyst, some of you know, is working in the mid 20th century, right up to his death in 1971. And his, why I like him so much is he was interested in starting from where the child was, not fitting children into theories, did it the child first. And he noticed that uh, babies in the second half of the first year of their life seemed to get attached to particular objects or comforters, such as blankets or teddies. And he linked it to what he saw in child development, that at that stage and on a bit, the baby starts to realise there's not just them in the world. There's a dawning realisation that there's me and there's not me. Before that, they're just a terrified bundle of sensations reliant on their carer to make the world safe and warm through love and noticing and working hard to understand what the baby needs. And that's mainly expressed physically at those very early stages through food and holding and comforting. I think that's why the object, how the object feels is so important. But when they start to realise there's a gap between them and other people and there's such an experience of separation, it can be alarming. And Winnicott noticed how often at this point an object could come in to stand in and be used as a bridge to ease that pain of separation. Um, uh, we, you know, classically Linus in the Peanuts cartoon and uh, how he holds the blanket. If you see the cartoons, the blanket is actually mirroring the body of the mother. This anxious child needs something to steady itself and the object does that. So I think we're familiar with it in that regard, but also Winnicott felt that the transitional object was actually the baby's first creative act. And I'm really drawn to this idea. The baby chooses it herself. You can't go in a shop and buy a transitional object. Um, the baby herself invests it with a significance as if to say, this is what is special to me. I did that. This is my special thing. And if a baby's lucky and loved, then its carers will also respect its significance and believe absolutely in its magic. Back to Roger Robinson's grandmother and it being something that connects you with another person. I think as adults through life, objects also, as we saw in the things you wonderfully put in the chat bar there, continue to be highly significant and carry parts of ourselves. And our precious objects, they have, as Seamus Heaney said about writing, our writing, they have the feel of us about them and they help us know ourselves better. And he began to think of how a person's artistic or cultural life exists in a kind of third space as a transitional phenomena, somewhere between conscious and unconscious, which I think is a wonderful way of thinking about what happens in therapy, uh, particularly ch child therapy, as children aren't aware a lot of the time of what's going on, but, but neither are they not aware. It's um, a very particular thing. Uh, and um, they help us, crucially, our artistic life helps us manage the strain of relating inner and outer reality. And any of us here who regularly do things creatively, put things into the world that weren't there before, I think we'll know that it's not that it's we're doing it for therapy, but somehow we're feeling better in the world by creating this thing that is from us, but not us. And obviously I've got Grayson Perry and his Teddy Alan Measles in my head. So all that is there and in the room where I work there's lots of toys and games and objects and I noticed that over time children get particularly attached to certain things in the room 
and they become special to them and the things they land on seem to tell me something about their internal world and that helps me understand them better and that's something I really wanted to draw out in the book how this happens how the therapeutic process facilitates the selection of the objects and crucially how it helps how it helps the child have a better relationship with themselves and communicate themselves more um, expressively and I found there's a kind of poetry in that process and that's why I wanted each chapter to be called for the objects in it each child put with the object they put something into the world that wasn't there before and that's the essence of creativity I think and um, I just was thinking about how in the work I described with Jake who'd come to the UK from a different country in his early sessions he just wanted to play really violent annihilatory war games in the sand and he had to be completely in control but gradually week on week an alternative place emerged which he called Peaceland which had um, Snoopy as its mayor so I'm just going to read a short abstract. Let's make books. Let's make an island, Jake said. I quickly cut islands from paper while alongside me, he built a war plane from Lego, which he placed on one of the islands. He then made a Lego boat full of people arriving at the island. People already live here, Jake said, as the new arrivals got out of the boat. But they look at each other and realise they're the same, so they don't fight. That was an amazing development about how Jake was experiencing the world. Over the weeks, Peacetown evolved into an archipelago of different islands. And on one, he built a large temple out of Jenga brook, bricks so people could worship. Another time, people went into the forest where they'd heard there was a monster, but together they dealt with the monster and it didn't, it didn't over, overtake them. A war plane was placed on another island and one session it kept flying very low and very loud and everybody was very afraid, which was something I could bring into the room with my voice and affect. But it didn't drop its bombs. Snoopy was in charge of making the society work and each week there were new additions, railway tracks to link the islands, lands to be farmed, children to have a school to get educated in, doctors to treat them if they were sick. In one beautiful session, fishermen brought home their catch and sat in a circle around the fire, eating and talking, which was a way of being that just didn't seem to be in um, Jake's, Jake's view of the world before. He was gradually imagining in and creating a different kind of world, one in which war was not a given. And the possibility of peace began to be reflected in how he related to me, much less, um, much more friendly, uh, much less oppositional. And I heard from his parents in his pay relationships outside. So I think that's an example of how these games, these co-creations, these particular objects can just be a way for the child to show you that things are beginning to feel differently inside. And as a therapist, you're facilitating that and bringing it in and helping it grow. Uh, and I found a, I think I put a few examples of this kind of thing in the book. And the other idea I have is of object games, where the creation of a game becomes something that's shared and personal only to you and the therapist, which makes it very relational. And with Polly, a girl with Down syndrome who'd been struggling at school with friends, we made up a game together using the emoji cushions. The game hadn't existed before, only us understood it. We had special rules and understandings. And through playing it, she helped express, it helped Polly express her feelings. But the playing of it was intensely relational in itself. And that, that had been something that Polly had been struggling with. Because as well as my preoccupation with objects, I really wanted this book to illustrate how therapy is most importantly beyond theory or technique or strategies or diagnosis, an opportunity for relationship. Very often the difficulties that a child faces is in their relationship with themselves and how they are in their own skin and thereby with others. And we all need good relationships to get the most out of life. These need to be reciprocally rewarding. So it's always made sense to me that a relationship is likely to be the best source of healing and repair, which is one reason why exclusion in school or anywhere else doesn't sit well with me at all. And my supervisees, some of them are here I know, <laughs> will vouch that I never stop going on about it. It's the relationship that does the healing. This is something I've learned from my supervisor, Anne, and the trust, the communication, the empathy, experiencing yourself as interesting, appreciated, fun to be with, understood that somebody gets you feeling felt 
that's what helps build a strong sense of oneself as valued and valuable. And I wanted the book to show how play-based therapy offers a thousand opportunities for these emotional states. And the last thing, and I've nearly finished, but the last thing I wanted to show in this book was that the circumstances, the external circumstances of children's lives, in my experience working with children from a many different backgrounds. The external circumstances really do make a difference to their mental health. This won't come as news to lots of you, I know, but poverty, poor housing, structural inequality, discrimination due to race or disability, these really do exacerbate mental distress. As a therapist, me and anyone else out there who's doing this work, we can be a witness to it and a protester against it. Some of the hardest to reach children are the most in need and we have to keep making the case for them. Um, I write in the book about Jordan, a young black boy picking up a handful of light plastic balls, throwing them angrily around the room, saying what I'm angry about is knife crime and gang violence and gun crime and racism and two people who do something wrong and then only one of them gets into trouble, which I thought was kind of poetry. Um, the balls came so hard. These were real things in Jordan's life. Uh, his life was difficult anyway, made harder by the poverty in which he lived. But um, we have to acknowledge that this is all part of what comes into the room when a child comes into the room. Um, raging inequality is terrible for all children, but it's particularly difficult for some. And when he could be like that, I could try and imagine in what's it like to be him in the moment and let his feeling take up the space and voice my sense of the truth and the injustice of his situation in a way which was empathic, containing and an active witness. And what I really hope is that part of what the thing this book does is empower others who work alongside children, whatever capacity, to recognise just what they can offer, what we all can offer if we put our minds to it in terms of fostering individual creativity, offering relationship and also to be advocates where there is injustice, helping bring hope and change to individual children and the world that they're a part of. So that's what I wanted to say. Thanks, Tamsin. We're going to be taking questions from Tamsin after. Um, this book represents not just, well, I get the feeling it represents not just the words on the page, which takes confidence and courage and bravery, but also a lifetime of work that Tamsin has done with children and young people, what I would term the good fight. And I suppose there's lots of different people in here working as psychotherapists or therapists uh, with children and young people all across the world. And uh, we appreciate all of the work and the good work that you do across the world. We're going to do something untoward in this event right now. We're going to do something that forces you to interact just for a period of 10 minutes. And for that, you might need a paper and pen or you can use your computer to do some typing. Uh, I am a poet and me and Tamsin have um, spoken a lot and uh, collaborated before on workshops uh, because I'm just so interested as uh, with the poet as an object. Uh, so the idea of a poet coming into being, a poem coming into being, and um, Tamsin and me have often talked about uh, uh, that idea. Um, I want you to think of an object that's important to you. It doesn't have to be the one that you chose at the beginning. It could be something day-to-day -day and domestic uh, just like Tamsin said, someone walks into a space and they pick certain objects. You're walking into this situation right now. And you're going to pick certain objects. So you could pick a fork or a toaster or you could pick a mug, a tea mug, or you might pick something that's closer to yourself. Think about that object for a second. Uh, on your bit of paper, I want you to describe maybe in about five or six words how it feels in your hand, perhaps how it sounds, um, how it feels or how it sounds. Um, we're going to bring the object to life now. We're going to think if it could move, how would it move? Like, uh, would it walk with a limp? Would it slide across the floor? You want to bring your object to life. So for the kitchen knife, I might say it spins uh, across the floor. So you've got uh, how it feels in your hand and if it could move, how would it move? Tamsin, uh, perhaps you've got a prompt. Just to carry on the theme of all the amazing things that objects can do for us. 
if this object could speak, what would it say? What Brilliant. would it say to you? Brilliant. So if it could speak, what would it say? And Tamsin um, shared the Roger Robinson. I'm going to share this Charles Simich piece. Uh, if there's anyone from the States, maybe they've heard of Charles Simich or even, even people from here. Um, Charles Simich is a master at object play um, and a master of being succinct with language. This goes, fork. This strange thing must have crept right out of hell. It resembles a bird's foot worn around the cannibal's neck. As you hold it in your hand, as you stab with it into a piece of meat, it is possible to imagine the rest of the bird, its head, which like your fist, is large, bold, beakless, and blind. Which is like one of my favourite poems, just because it's, just because it's so morbid. And also it's a domestic tool, which I love. Um, so you're going to do something significantly less good as Charles Simich now. You're gonna to pull together three or four lines. Uh, and if you're brave, you can put those three or four lines about your object into the chat window. These are some of the ones I like. Tamsin, do you wanna choose one that you like as well? Um, uh, I'll go first. Uh, a pottery puffin, rough, but only like a tongue is rough. It flaps its wings, but does not fly away. I am a gift to and fro from you to mum back again. Love it. Time's it. Hang on, hang on. I think I'm a bit, uh, I just saw one, where's it gone? I can go again. My pen, it's fun, it's done. How it feels to be me, me, you. The reader, it feels, it's fun. It rolls away around me to me. It's, it's fun, it's done, my pen said. <laughs> <laughs> the glorious thud into the curve right in the middle of my foot. It creates a vibration from the root of my feet up to my shoulders. I feel mighty. The ball telepathically floats, rolls and bolts over to those who... I've lost the last line. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cliffhanger. <laughs> ah, those who need it most. It whispers, take me as your protector. Share me with those around you. I am the marble you marveled at with joy as a boy. Great. The marble you marveled at. That's fantastic. The, the green bowl, smooth and dark on the outside, cold and hot when filled with soup. It cannot move unless I carry it carefully so as not to spill the contents. Eat this good stuff I am holding for you. There's absolutely loads in it. like the biggest poetry exercise in history, 181 <laughs> entries. <laughs> what we'll do is we'll save the chat and then we'll put it somewhere and in 15 years' time we'll look back and think, wow, that was a good exercise. Well, um, go on then, we'll read one more. Um, mug. The reg this regular container exists in every corner. It reminds me of a hole waiting to be filled. As I hold you in my hand, I empty you into my throat. Fill me up, hold me tight, carry me around by your side. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. Christina from Karnak says, maybe we'll publish them. <laughs> um, what an absolute pleasure. Thank you everybody for taking part in that. Uh, really appreciate it. We're moving to another speaker uh, quick enough. Uh, she's the program director of the integrative uh, child psychotherapist training at the Institute for Arts and Therapy and Education and a UKCP registered integrative, I think I pronounced that word right, child psychotherapist with a background working in the arts. She has worked extensively with children and teenagers in multicultural inner city community projects, schools and multidisciplinary teams for over 30 years. Uh, let's give a hand waving round of applause to Roz <laughs> Reed. Hi, Roz. Thank you very much. That's a lovely welcome. Um, when Tamsin contacted me to tell me that she'd written a book about integrative child psychotherapy, I was thrilled. This is a first. Integrative child psychotherapy is a relatively new training, barely 20 years old. And I was delighted to hear that at last people are starting to write about our valuable work and let others know what we're doing and how we're doing it and what it means. This book is a great read. 
eight stories that reveal the different parts, not only of a child, but of a child psychotherapist in relationship with that child. It's playful, creative, directive, and non-directive. And one of the special qualities, I think, of the training at the Institute for Arts and Therapy and Education called, uh, don't tell me, it's odd, but it's called I8. It's, it's, it's not just its creativity, which we are immersed in from the first year, but the students are encouraged to build a warm interest in the child, a relationship. As one training supervisor told me, children who see students at the Institute enjoy going to therapy. And I think Tamsin has captured that beautifully in this book. Children don't usually choose to attend therapy themselves, but are referred by others. So they can be very anxious about attending. And so building a relationship is so important. What I especially loved about this book is that it reminded me of why after 20 years as a child psychotherapist, I still love this work so much. I felt proud to read of the moving and relevant work that we do. I found new things I didn't know. And I loved it, for instance, I love the idea of the Playmate transference. Well, no doubt I will be seeing that in many students' papers in the future. And it reminded me of the simple idea of just getting alongside a troubled child, getting to know them and seeing how we can help. Using ourselves, our empathy, our creativity and spontaneity, our thinking and relational style to connect. It would be easy to be deceived into thinking this is not a complex work. The book's simplicity and easy style, I think, is quite beguiling. Behind the engaging writing, I can see the solid thinking and theoretical framework. Psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic theory, neuroscience, attachment theory, emotional regulation, child development research, understanding of metaphor, play, game, storytelling, and the arts are carefully underpinning all the stories. There is technique, but it's not technique driven. It's not a dry book. Theory is not allowed to eclipse the relationship which remains central in all the stories. It's an incredibly useful book. I'll definitely be adding it to our key reading list, Tamsin, for our students. Um, I'd love for them to be in as inspired as I am. But not just that, having read it, I would also recommend it to potential students, to parents, school support staff and teachers and social workers. In fact, anyone interested in what a child psychotherapist can offer children. In each of the seven, eight, well, eight, sorry, case studies, Tamsin balances telling the story with little vignettes so that the relationship between therapist and client comes alive. She then follows it by an insight packed with wisdom and experience. And it's those little snippets that are so beautifully put all the way through and undergirded by the solid theoretical framework. It makes reading this joy, this book a joy. So this is one short example. I think I've got still got time to read it. So this is Harkin, who I think is how you pronounce his name. Uh, no, I'm going to read from Theo, who's the fourth story in the book. He's a little French boy of seven who has selective mutism. Theo came in and looked at the sand tray figures again. I remembered out loud the figures he'd chosen. I mentioned the painting. I was keen to let Theo know he'd been held in my mind since the previous session and that our meeting had had an impact of some kind on me, but I kept it light. If a child is anxious, they will find it so much harder to communicate freely. My own anxiety can inhibit the attempts to feel a relaxed feeling in the room. I was aware that I was talking more than usual and wondered who I was protecting from the silence that would follow if I stopped talking. I stayed quiet and we bore it. Theo seemed frozen in the moment, not able to pick up the figures. After a minute or two, I said, maybe it was hard to decide and said we could paint if you'd like to. He nodded and we set about preparing the materials. He placed two lights on the floor in front of him and set them out up in a jousting context. contest. He began to draw. As he worked, I idly painted coloured stripes on a piece of paper. I will often work alongside a child, although I know that not every therapist does this. In this case, I didn't want to pressure Theo by making what he was doing too much of a focus. It gave me somewhere else to look. This is a little boy who's selective mutism, who is very self-conscious. I was so aware of his intense self-consciousness. He hadn't known me long enough to trust me, not to put pressure on him. In the early sessions, my priority is to communicate hope, friendliness and curiosity, but not in a way that weighs on the child. And I think that sort of sums up really the whole book. So thank you, Tamsin, and congratulations.
Thanks so much, Ross. We really appreciate you. A uh, round of applause for Ross. Uh, another poem. Hello. Come inside for a nice cup of tea, my mug. I welcome you in my hand. You greet me cosy, fantastical humour and absurdity on a Monday morning. I like the opening to that poem because it's so creepy, Emma. Well done on that. Someone said uh, that they unwittingly split their poem up. I understand on Zoom and press enter, it just sends it. That's okay, because like someone else said, it's a group fragment poem. Uh, and thanks to everyone who took part in that. We're moving on to another guest, um, a consultant, child and adolescent psychotherapist. She's the author of Live Company, Psychotherapy with Autistic Borderline deprived and abused children and has edited with Susan Reed, Autism and Personality, Findings from the Tavistock Autism Workshop. There's even a book in her honor, edited by Judith Edwards, entitled Being Alive, Building on the Work of Anne Alvarez, uh, which was published in 2002. Um, her latest book, The Thinking Heart, Three Levels of Psychoanalytic Therapy with Disturbed Children, was published on Rootleg uh, Rootledge in April 2012. It's Anne Alvarez. Hi, Anne, and welcome. Hi, RJ. Okay, well, in her introduction to the book, this wonderful book, Tamsin writes, How does it feel to be you? This question, she says, will guide me through all the sessions we will share. The answers may be revealed by what the child tells me but the things we do together and how we are together as the sessions unfold will be my main sources of insight. Often what we do in therapy as child therapists does not look or feel like what we think therapy is or should be. It can be a mysterious process. Well, I'm very pleased to be part of the welcoming committee for this book. It's always a pleasure to read Tamsin's writing, whether it's fiction, poetry, or professional. Usually, by the way, the latter is the product of her generous self engaging in editing other people's work. But this time, finally, it is her own brilliantly clarifying account of her own clinical work. And it is full of wisdom, innovation, and dramatic flow. The narrative pulls us along the explanations following seamlessly in its wake, so we are never interfered with in our quest to understand what is happening to the child, between her and the child, and even sometimes why. She is very clear and therefore kind to the reader, as she is to her patients. Amson's training at I-8 differs from mine, which was more strictly and classically psychoanalytic in the 1960s. Aside from the range of creative materials she uses, she probably had far more encouragement to stay in the transitional area that is in the play than we would have had in the 60s. I was taught by Winnicott himself in the 60s, but I seem to remember that there was a period in the 70s and 80s when he wasn't even read in the Tavistock training. So much for diversity of thought but thank goodness all that has changed now. But I think for many of us, there was still a remnant of the idea that if we haven't made a transference interpretation or linked something in this session with the past, we weren't doing real therapeutic work. Simply enjoying the playing together, regardless of what it might inform us about, and for that matter, regardless of where it might lead or lead back to, was never the point. Gradually, both the information gleaned from naturalistic baby observation, the findings from the exciting new developmental research and the treatment of ever iller, traumatized and neglected child patients began to throw a light on something more than, certainly than neutrality, but something more than even containment in the parent's response to the baby. That is things like mutual delight, attunement, proto-musical dialogue, mismatch and repair, and by implication, love. And these findings not only lit up the nature of early parent-infant interaction, they had for some of us huge implications for the nature of the interaction 
between the patient and therapist. These implications were especially important in relation to the severity of the psychopathology in the patient, and even more especially where it was not simply a question of repairing damaged pathways, but of filling the void of deficit. Tamsin has not only a fantastic nose for the despair, horror, and bitterness which may lie behind a child's defenses, but also for that which is really missing. And we still have so much to learn about that, I think. And she is like a musician in the delicate, of course, she's a poet. She is like a musician in the delicacy with which she approaches these matters. Some of us have had to go through hundreds of theoretical hoops to earn our right and permission to be flexible and more active with our very empty patients. Tamsin, with her flair, talent, empathy, and training in the creative, just jumped in. And here is part of her conclusion. It's rather long, but it's wonderful. Child psychotherapy is not a behavioral intervention. It is a relational response to human mental distress, which draws on our understanding of the importance of play, the healing power of creativity, the significance of early care and the detrimental impact of prolonged exposure to adverse experiences in childhood. In responding to each child as a valuable and unique human being, Whatever their circumstances, experiences, or background, therapists are resisting splits and binary thinking. Thinking blame and defensiveness or acting out. It can sometimes feel that to respond in such ways is to be countercultural. Current British society is highly complex, and this complexity is being felt by children and communicated by them through their behavior and mental health. It has been my experience that most children and young people and their parents, whatever their heritage and circumstances, want similar things, to love and be loved and live a safe, meaningful, valued life in which we can be our best selves. Excluding anyone from these aspirations is inhumane. Doing it on the grounds of poverty is as wrong as doing it on grounds of race, gender, or disability. I'm going to read that one again. Doing it on the grounds of poverty is as wrong as doing it on grounds of race, gender, or disability. Therapists can challenge that exclusion using the tools of therapeutic practice, which we have worked hard to acquire and develop. May Tamsin have a long and productive therapeutic and writing life, as we need her out there doing this again and again. Thank you so much. Round of applause, everybody. Thank you so much, Anne. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you. That's really brilliant. And um, it's lovely to hear the um, uh, sections of the book, which are come out so meaningful from different people's voices. Yeah, I was just thinking about how lovely that you're here and kind of helping to build these connections between the sort of historically psychoanalytic tradition and then what, you know, more creative uh things you've talked the way you've talked about the relational creative work that i'm doing and i just wondered if you could just give us just a little bit about your own ideas about this and your levels of therapeutic interaction and how you've understood that as a way of helping the child to make meaning of themselves in therapy i think a lot of people were finding in different ways but not but puzzled by the fact that these classical, rather complicated interpretations, two-part interpretations, you feel this, but underneath you really feel that, or you want to make me feel stupid because you're trying to get rid of your own feelings of inferiority, that involved a kind of two-tracked, complicated, reflective thinking, um, didn't reach a lot of patients, partly because sometimes they just couldn't understand it. If they were too deprived, they couldn't follow long, complicated connections like that. And they, you know, a deprived kid will say, you say, oh, you've got a sore knee, but I think you're really upset because we're having to say goodbye tomorrow for a break or because your uncle just died or something. And he says, no, no, I've just got a sore knee. 
And I think we had to learn to say things like, gee, that looks like it really hurts. And that, you know, simple, humane, human responses went a lot further with, particularly with these deprived child who weren't used to metaphorical thinking and symbolic thinking and complicated, intricate thinking. So, um, and I think we had to learn to be simpler, better just to amplify a feeling. Kids, a lot of these kids, as you all know, if you do this work, um, don't know how to name a feeling, don't know how to identify a feeling, don't know it's them that's having it. It's something floating up there, even if they can get a grasp on it. So I think I had to learn to do much more of that simplistic, describing the whatness of experience rather than the why, why because-ness, whereas I was trained to do more why because-ness. And then I think, especially with the very severe autistic children, of a certain subtype, I had to learn to be something that was quite unpsychoanalytic, but is probably quite familiar to you, I eight people, because you are freer than we are in many ways. I'm not saying we're all bad or all stupid, but that we were missing certain things about this iller range of patients, and that some of them um, needed calling into being and calling into contact in a quite active vitalizing, reclaiming way. And I think you do a lot of that just quite naturally. But I call that not the why because or even the whatness, but the kind of hey function. Hey, to a child is a very long way away. You, you mustn't be too intrusive with some of them, but some neglected children as well as some types of autistic children need calling into being. And I think it's something to do with how we address the question of meaningfulness, which you talked a lot about, or meaninglessness, and that in the, the, the Weller children, you can tell them about alternative meanings. You, you're trying to be friendly today, but I think you're really furious with me because, and you can do that with children who can think. Um, and that's offering an alternative meaning. And with the descriptive level, as you pointed out earlier today, it's about amplifying meanings and giving them a bit more weight and heft than the child thought they might have. But at the third level, I think we're insisting on meaning to very empty children who don't think anything matters. And they don't, they're not even depressed like depressed people because they don't even think it matters that nothing matters. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Okay. That's so uh, moving what you say there. They don't even know that it matters that they feel like they do. They don't even know that there is a thing that isn't this feeling or that it's a feeling or that, yeah, that it, even that they are a thing that matters. Yeah. And that's yeah. why I'm so inspired. I've been so inspired over all these amazing years we've been able to work alongside each other or you've been, been my supervisor of this business of uh, this process of sort of just bringing that sense of a person's selfness uh, into life, into being yeah. by the way that you you talk about, you know, auxiliary egos and being live company and an enlivener and a an vitalizing presence. Yeah. And I love that word, vitalizing. And, um, you know, because there's an idea about child therapy is this very, as you say, this very fancy highfalutin thing based on diagnoses and complicated mental health issues. And of course, we need to know that stuff. I'm not denigrating it at all but we also need to make sure that therapy is there for people who aren't going to be working like that and just need to know that they are and appreciated and uh, a feeling is a feeling so you just say that so wonderfully and I've always felt a great you know inspiration from it and a great connection between that and uh, what I'm doing and what I learned to do better um, over the years and particularly through my training at IAT. Thank you so much for being here Anne, and being part of that. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you. Thanks, Samson, for interrupting me to do that conversation. <laughs> I appreciate it because it was uh, illuminating. Other people said that in the chat as well. And keep an eye on that because there's a lot of people giving thanks for the book and happy for your success. We're reaching the end of our uh, event, but before we go, we wanted to invite you, uh, the amazing public, 171 of you now, to suggest perhaps questions that you'd like to ask the author herself while she's here, um, or anybody else, I suppose, um, about the book would be preferable. Uh, if you put it in the chat window, it will probably be quicker, just because I can only see 
some 24 people or something on the screen. Um, so if you've got a question, that would be really appreciated. Um, while that's going on, I'll just say thank you so much to all of you for coming on a Friday night. Wild Friday night, celebrate this book. Um, <laughs> but I, I know Tamsin really appreciates it. And Tamsin has put a lot of time and effort, not only into the book, but into the event, motivating us all. Um, there's some comments coming up that you can read, uh, Tamsin. I'll, I'll just say now, there's probably going to be more than we can answer. So I'm just going to pick out a few and Tamsin will have a look and see the ones that she can get her teeth into properly. What do you think it means if a child doesn't have a transitional object, uh, Tamsin? Ah, well, that depends, doesn't it? I mean, I don't think it's something that all children have in the course of their lives. You know, lots of babies grow up and wouldn't acquire one and we would know from our own histories and our own child's history whether there was something or whether it came and went. I think in the therapy room I would be very surprised if certain objects didn't begin to have significance or speak to the child in some way and if that was happening what I would be really thinking is what was happened to this child's curiosity how bad has it been that they are not curious that they don't want to explore and I mean I write in the book about when a child walks into the room there's all the difference in the world before one who runs over and starts picking up the toys and saying hey what's this what's this and where did you get this from and how much did it cost and what does this do where you see a, a really lively curious the world is an interesting place and this is going to be an interesting thing from a child that comes in and maybe stands still or keeps their head down and doesn't move towards anything at all and that's where we're in the territory of you know what I would think of sometimes as sort of hidden children or somehow um, a bit squashed by by flattening events that have happened and then then it's more like Anne was talking about a revit a, right, a vitalizing function of saying what catches your eye? Is there anything here that you notice? Is there anything that looks interesting? Have a good look and gently encourage the child to be interested. So I don't know if that answers your question, Jane, but it's interesting. Everybody's so different. Is there a common object, Emma asks, um, from your practice that is often oh. chosen by the children you work with and why uh, do you think that is? Yeah, well, I guess um, Jenga is one thing I never go anywhere without, rather heavy to carry around, but I do and it can create so many things but um in the uh i have this uh i was thinking that i have this um dragon with a knight on top this is really i um this has really been a big winner christabel i think if you're still here you'll know this is thanks to you um but yeah the the knight comes off um there's another matching one the dragon is so colorful there's so many possible feelings a dragon and the knight might be having. It's a very, very appealing, useful toy. So, yeah, that and, one. <laughs> and um, when they're uh, in the play, do you allow the child complete freedom to choose their form of play? Leslie oh, asks. God, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I say that, actually. Yes, initially. But in the book, I explain how sometimes things get stuck. Uh, and there is... Um, uh, I mean, there isn't really time to go into it now, but uh, I am looking for life and development and interest. And if I feel the child and me are stuck in repetitive play, that is def sort of keeping the child away from relationship, then I will try and liven it up. I will try and suggest changes. It's not completely non-directive because if two of you are stuck in a you know, in a world where nothing is interesting, then that's not good for anybody. So I think that's, again, the enlivener role that comes in. So I really hope I get that over in the book, because I think it's a tricky thing about when to when to suggest and when to just let it happen and notice. I think also in the book, it's um, really simply written. So there's not much theory. So Alwyn asks, is there any books you would recommend for parents to read? And I mean, I don't, I'm not a psychotherapist, so I haven't gone to um, uni to study it. But when I read the book, having worked with young people and children for the last 20 years, I was able to really connect with it without the theory stuff to hold me yeah. back 
well, not to hold me back, but to confuse me as such. So I think that that's an important question. There are loads of books out there. I don't think I've time to go to to uh, go. You mean with more theory in? Oh goodness me, I can't think off the top of my head. I think it means with less theory in for less parents. Yeah. In the classroom by Heather Geddes. That's really good. Uh, Nurturing Nature by Graham Music. That has got quite a lot of theory in, but it's really really good. Roz, I don't know if anything pops into your mind. Your Margot's book, Conversations That Matter, is quite nice. Conversations That Matter, that, yes, absolutely. And um, What Every Parent Needs to Know, also Margot's book. That's brilliant. The last question I'm just asked, because Alice has put it in and I'm interested. Can I ask about how your own process as an artist, um, i.e. a poet, helps you be more emotionally respectful to the children working through art? Well... <laughs> Um, I suppose I'm really interested and res I'm respectful of the process and that it is a way to get out what's inside you. It is a really valid way without being over-interpretive of it. It's a way of making something beautiful. So I think that's lovely for children whose lives are often very difficult. Um, and it's it's mutually very uh, enlivening and engaging when you're doing it. So I'm aware of the sort of capacity for shared pleasure in it. I don't know if that answers the question really. I really want to say thank you to people. I knew this would happen. I would get in the questions and then I'll just feel really Go awesome. for it. I was going to ask you. That was going to yeah, be my question. I, I just want to, because I don't know. I know it's boring in a way, but it's just so important to me because, um, you know, you're not on your own when you're a therapist. You're on your own in the room with the child, but um, you're not on your own because you take with you the people you've had luck, you've been lucky enough to have alongside you. And that's my supervisors, Valerie, Ann, Roz, Reed, and Ellie Baker from I8. I really wanted to thank Susie Orbach with a generous endorsement for the book. I don't think she's here, but I just really, really appreciated it. Christopher McEwen, who I worked with, who set up the most amazing room for us to work with. All the people I trained with at I8, they were just incredible. Ruth, my friend Ruth Mercer, who's kept me steady going forward to tonight. Um, in the last two years, I've been lucky. I have so many wonderful supervisees who just inspire me every every day. And lately I've worked for a fantastic organization called Football Beyond Borders. So I really wanted to thank Jack and Brooke from there and look, check them out, check out Football Beyond Borders. They're doing incredible stuff. Writing companions, RG, Alice Hiller, uh, Gillian Slovo, who are a member of her writing group. Um, obviously to all the people at Karnak, and I think I've said that, but also my friends and my family, Nick, who's so patient and brilliant, um, and two people who aren't with us. Uh, my dad, he's not here anymore. He was always so supportive and encouraging of my writing. And my precious friend and colleague, Alan Corbett, a lot of you here knew him and he was very special to you too. He was always on at me to do this thing. So wherever you are, Al, this one's for you. And just thank you all for coming and making this such a special event. Honestly, I can't tell you how thrilling it is. Thanks so much, uh, everybody, for coming. Uh, sorry if I missed your question. They were, they were all great questions, but we just didn't have time. Uh, give yourselves a massive jazz hands round of applause. Uh, and get yourself the book. It's from Karnak, and you can get it online, and it's well worth a read. Uh, other than that, have a beautiful Friday and a great weekend. See you later. Thank you, RG. Thank you, RG. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Bye, everyone.